I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over, and I have been reading Julia Alvarez for decades, and I will totally own it. I have been reading you since 1991. And I have reread you, you since. <laughs> oh, you are very kind. You are very, very kind, but that's not quite how it works. But here's the thing you have a new novel, The Cemetery of Untold Stories. And when Afterlife came out in 2020, you did a lot of sort of interviews where you were like, listen, this is my first novel as an elder. This is what I wanted to, I wanted to write a short lyrical novel. And in the afterword to the edition of Afterlife that I have, you also say, well, I'm kind of preparing the world to not have me in it. And I thought, but, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> Can we just talk about Afterlife for a second and just set it up for listeners who may not have picked it up yet, even though it's been out for a minute? Because I think it's really important to have that conversation before we get to the Cemetery of Untold Stories. Well, Afterlife, I didn't remember writing that in the afterlife, mm. I can believe you, but it, it is very much a, a novel in which I felt that it took me a while to write. There was a big space between the novels. I've been writing other things, but people say, why did it take you so long? And I, I was saying that I, I was sort of integrating this landscape of being now an elder. And what did that mean to be yeah. an elder um, in a community, to be an elder in your craft. What does that all mean? This was before the pandemic. It just happened to be a pandemic novel that was published in April of 2020, and we had just closed down two weeks beforehand. So it was weird because I had, prior to the pandemic, been thinking that we're living in elegiac times where we're, we're sort of witnessing the end of so many things, extinction of species, the end of a kind of civic community, you know, all the divisiveness, the pandemic of violence against communities of color, just things were falling apart. And my question to myself and proposed uh, the way a story proposes the question and works it through character and story and everything narrative what does it mean that we live in a time of brokenness and how do we keep faith with each other in ourselves? How do we not, you know, uh, turn into our bunkers and into the smaller versions of ourselves? So these preoccupations were on my mind and a short kind of elegiac novel, which seemed to me in the Japanese tradition of the haiku, where you strip everything away so only the essential remains seemed to me like the perfect form, a sort of a small diminished form that packs a lot. And also the, the format, the form of the novel is short and compact and stripped down novel for the themes it was, you know, reflecting. <laughs> so, you know, I thought of it very much as a novel that I had to understand this time of life to be able to accurately reflect it in the narrative of an older an older character. And I feel like we get the payoff, not just in reading Afterlife, but also in the Cemetery of Lost Stories, because what you're doing in the new book and the way you're connecting all of these disparate pieces of Dominican history with this writer called Alma, who <laughs> I really like her. She's great. But the questions you're asking about who gets to tell stories and which stories we value and the people you're using to tell these stories. I mean, this book is so smart and so funny and provocative, which is one of the reasons I love to read you because I always end up walking away thinking, oh, right. Oh, right. You always teach me something. Let's set up Cemetery of Lost Stories because it's a great idea. I'm pretty sure only you could have come up with it. <laughs> Alma... Uh, there are going to be people who assume, of course, that Alma is your absolute stand-in, but she is and she isn't. I mean, yes, she's a writer. Yes, she's inherited a piece of land in the Dominican Republic, but she has an idea that she pulls off, which is how we get to the new book. So would you set it up, please? As you were saying about afterlife, it's about an elder. And I don't focus so much on um, Antonia, the character right. in, in afterlife, so much on her writing life, just in her aging and her losses and how she deals with this 
and the challenges for someone who spent a lifetime in a profession teaching books, what happens when the stuff that happens in books happens, you know, in her own garage and it comes to her front door, you know, we can't just be armchair, you know, when we teach literature, we have these armchair high values, but what happens when you're challenged? So uh, Antonia was more an older person that had taught the literature and has it in her head. And Ama is a writer, um, definitely a writer. You know, as Edward Said writes about the late stage of a writer, a writer at her late stages. And uh, she has come to a point where she really has come to the end of her animo, her inspiration, her duende. And she just, it's time to put her writing life to rest. And so the characters, however, are still in her head, still haunting. She's still obsessed with them. So she decides to lay them literally to rest. <laughs> so she, all the boxes, all the drafts, everything she takes back to the homeland, which, you know, interestingly enough, is where a lot of the stories came from mm -hmm. that ended up in her book. She takes her, her characters and stories back to where they came from and buries them in this inherited piece of property, uh, which that she then creates a cemetery for untold stories. She puts all the boxes, lays them to rest in the ground, and has a friend that creates sculptures for each one. And she thinks that's it. But, you know, the Mexican proverb that goes um, for protest, that goes, they tried to bury us, they did not know we were seeds. Well, this the version in this book is, she tried to bury us, she did not know we were stories. <laughs> So the stories refuse to stay quiet. They rise up and tell their secret stories that they withheld from her. And the people in the surrounding barrios who become interested in what's going on become characters and listeners and their own storytellers. So we get this narrative that sort of, you know, keeps growing and is pretty much grassroots. And they're untold in the sense that they're not celebrated in the first world. They're not published. They're not distributed. They're not put out there. There are these stories, this richness that exists worldwide. Many of them orator or oral storytellers that we in our first world thinking that we're in charge of the canon and we're in charge of what's really literary don't have any idea many times are out there feeding, feeding so many of us who come from those worlds and then, you know, end up writing some of those stories down. Well, one of the touches that I love in the new book is that Alma has a pen name. <laughs> and I was not expecting that because I thought, OK, you know, here's Alma. She's written. All I mean, it's clear that Alma has had a career that has worked out quite nicely for her. But her pen name is Shahrazad. Of the Arabian Nights, right. Which, of course, is the perfect metaphor for what's happening in the cemetery, because all of these stories are coming together. And Alma is not necessarily the filter for all of them. She's, she's hired a local woman, Philomena, who has quite a backstory. And we learn it sort of as we go. And I'm not going to spoil it here, obviously, because it's a terrific hey. story. But Philomena also, she can't read. I mean, she's of an era and a moment where she was just, as a girl, she was not taught to read or write. And so watching her process these stories and how she learns them, I... it's charming, even though some of the details might not be charming. It's charming watching Philomena figure out how she's connected mm -hmm. to all of these things that she had been told for quite some time she had no connection to. She had one role in the world, and this is what she was expected to do. and those were the boundaries. And that was it. And here she's saying, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. And we've got characters who end up in the United States. We've got characters who end up in Canada briefly. <laughs> 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 we've got characters who are based on people in the historical record. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, Trielo's first wife, who honestly, I or second wife? First wife? Second wife. Second he wife. actually had a first one, and then this was the second one. 
but she was erased from history and banished by the third wife. <laughs> so obviously I had never known that she existed, but you give her quite a great voice. Was she someone you always thought about sort of poking at, or did you just decide it worked in the context of Cemetery of Untold Stories to have her in there? I was really intrigued by Bienvenida, who had the amazing name Bienvenida Innocencia, Welcome Innocence, <laughs> if you translate it literally. But, you know, I was thinking, of course, writing in the time of the butterflies about the Mirabar sisters and women who stood up to the dictatorship and lost their lives as a result. And Bienvenida is actually the reverse of that, a woman that fell in love with El Jefe, told herself the story of who he really was and fell into the spell of that story and was believed. And all, all that I read and know about her was a really wonderful, good, sweet woman and ended up falling in love with a monster who eventually banished her. And she was also a casualty of the, ro uh, of the regime, a, a romantic, emotional casualty certainly with her own culpability, because she blinded herself and didn't allow herself to see what was out there. But I've been intrigued about, you know, who this person was and and a, a rather tragic life that he, she had once she was banished uh, that, you know, nobody has ever known about. She was buried in an unmarked grave in, in the end, because after the dictatorship, anything that was associated with a dictator was torn down and decimated. And although she had been one of his victims, she would have fallen prey to it. So when the family um, buried her, it's an unmarked grave, uh, which I believed I found in my research. Oh. But I can't be sure. Okay. Uh, yes. I have to say, I really liked her as a character. I'm not sure how much... I bounced back and forth between having empathy for her and and not because I know the history that she comes out of and how can you not? And the answer is you can tell yourself a story, right? Like, I mean, I, I'm playing with rhetoric here for a second because people make choices and she made a choice, but I really like your version of her. And I like the idea that she did struggle with not understanding why she made the choices she made. And I think that's why at the end, she doesn't want her story told because, you know, it's too painful for her. And she's filled with confusion about, you know, what, how narrative in a sense deceived her. So why would she want to go into a narrative? Why would she want to tell a story so that also is part of the novel, too, how stories are powerful and they can be transformative, but they can also be used to sway us and keep us from looking up um, and, and saying, as Perul Segal in a recent The Tyranny of the Tale, she wrote, what is this story not allowing us to see? And we see that so much with fake facts and narrative and manipulation of people through how you tell the story, what you leave out, what you invent. So we have to both honor this beautiful thing in our genetic makeup, uh, the critter who, who tells stories to make meaning of the world, and also the critter who uses stories to leave some out, to exclude, to do brutal things. So it's, I don't, I don't think the, sto the, the novel provides any kind of an answer or final message or whatever, but it, it says it's important that we look at these things, that we consider these things. Well, I mean, propaganda is story, right? Well, History books are story. Like They're bestsellers. Propaganda, yeah. you know, when a propaganda takes over and you mm -hmm. have a or Trump, you have, you know, yeah, you have stories that are bestsellers, you know? It's, yeah. I think sometimes we limit ourselves when we're thinking about the role of story in creating culture and connecting us and, or separating us, you know, whatever right. it may be. Yeah. And I love the fact that Philomena, even though she can't 
read or write, story isn't lost to her. Story yeah. exists for her. If she has a journey understanding how, she, you know, she'll come to that point. And I'm, again, yeah. I'm not going to spoil any of that, but watching her come to understand that she is not in fact bound by what she doesn't know Ooh. is yeah. so important. And she's really unforgettable. I don't think I've met someone like her in literature in a really long time. And she's kind of our opening into this whole idea that you're talking about, that anyone can have a story, right? Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, the problem with canons, I mean, the, one of the ways to safeguard narrative from those dangerous aspects of it is to make it more and more inclusive, because then you have more and more points of view. Once you create a gated community that's exclusive, a literary gated community, a canon, you are it's dangerous because you are not letting story be what story is, you know, in which we become the other. You're saying we can only become certain others, you know. Another good reason for a multicultural uh, canon, uh, and let's not even call it a canon, terrible word anyhow, a multicultural bookshelf, it enriches it and protects us against the myopicness of one or another point of view, you know. Looking back on the 90s, and I've been a bookseller for a really long time, but you know, there was a moment where it was kind of you and Sandra Cisneros and Leslie Marmon Silko and Maxine Hong Kingston and Toni Morrison. There was this very sort of small group of Black and Brown and Latina writers who were kind of let in, and Asian American, who were let into <laughs> sort of the bestseller lists, right? Like it, there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of movement. And sometimes the reviews were really weird. Mm, tell me about it. And oh, <laughs> I went back and revisited some of those reviews and I was like, uh-huh. Ouch. Yeah, there, was, yeah. There, were, there were some thoughts. And it, I was talking actually to Maggie Nelson about this recently because Darcy Steinke's Suicide Blonde came out in 92. Time of the Butterflies was 91. Garcia Girls was 94, 91, right? No, no. Um. Garcia Girls was 91, uh, indelible, oh. uh, because I've been writing already over 20, 25 years. Right. And in uh, 1991, when I was 41, Garcia Girls came out. <laughs> and then three years later, Butterflies, 44, 1994. Yeah. And then Mango Street was 92 or 91? No. How's the Mango? Sandra no, Cisneros. Not. Sandra Cisneros, my first poetry book was 84 and that was the same uh, year um it was uh the house on mango street so she was early and you know by the then we were being published by little regional publishing companies because you know no one in a mainstream publishing world thought that they could sell any books you know about people like us or by people like us i guess and luckily now we have elizabeth acevedo <laughs> And Angie Cruz. Yes. And we have Ada Lemon, who's yeah, a laureate, you know, and um, I, yes. I mean, Clavis Natura. I mean, there's some really, yeah. really great voices right now. There can always be more, but yep. we have made some progress. I, I won't deny that there is some progress. But one of the things I really appreciate, too, about your work is the fact that you are taught in high schools and colleges across the country. And banned. And banned, yes, unfortunately, and banned. And canon isn't a great word, but it is kind of the word we have, right? And we yeah. need to sort of redefine. You've got a character in the new book, Cemetery of Lost Stories, Pepito, who is Philomena's nephew, and he's a professor. And I love him as a character, but I also had a couple of moments where I was like, oh, you could do better. And I think you know what I'm referring to, because yeah. he has decided that the only way for him to finish his new book, which, you know, publisher Parish, he's a professor, he's got to do it, is to tie Latino writing to sort of Greek and Roman canon. <laughs> and it's not a stretch. You can write whatever you want. Yeah, but I really, I laughed when I saw what you were doing. And, you know, you just said it a second ago, we need to make more space. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, we just need to make more space. Yeah. And the thing to that that gives something its credentials or credibility is that, oh, you know, read Liz Acevedo. It's like great expectations. No, it, it can also be Liz Acevedo. We don't have to like tie it to something that has passed to make it. It's its, its own thing. You know, it, there can be similarities, you know, uh, but but it's that it, it's still a lingering feeling that these are the exceptions. And, and that they're, you know, they, they've they've towed the line of our classic tones and acceptable uh, literature, and that's why they're good. Sometimes they can be good because they're so unlike anything out there, or they're their very own version of what's mm-hmm. out. I mean, if you think about it too, Charles Dickens was writing to his moment. Yeah, uh, it was just it was Victorian England, but he was writing to his moment. He was writing to his political concerns at the time. He was giving characters outlandish names. And man, if he did not like a character, you knew it because you saw the name and you were just like, OK, I you know, the guy did a lot of writing on the nose. Now, did he help revolutionize novels as we know them today? Sure. I mean, there's a lot that he's done. There are certainly writers who are Dickensian in their style or their scope and yay hurrah. I mean, you could argue that Stephen King is Dickensian, but that's a whole different, no. that's a whole different conversation for <laughs> us to have. And that's great. But at the same time, how do we make space? Right? Because we have writers who are now writing to our current moment. We had writers in the sixties and the seventies who were writing to a current moment. And a lot of those books had staying power in ways that maybe you didn't know quite out of the gate. Right. 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 How do we broaden the base? How do we? Yeah. Um, You even think of, I mean, Barbara Kingsolver takes, uh, you know, uh, um, David Copperfield and turns it on his head and shows that it is of the moment, but she makes it into her very own thing, you know, but we're just part also of what we're saying, because at one point in the novel, The Secretary of Untold Stories, uh, one of the characters, where Bella, is telling stories to some women who know nothing about literature. They're campesinas, and th- she's telling them stories. And the stories she tells them, which she learned from Pepito of Greek mm-hmm. myths, they they think it's like stories they heard in the campo. So even the Charles Dickens and the Homers, they got their stories from the grassroots. And that's part also of the Cemetery of Untold Stories. We should not be snobs about this. We, you know, we're the, we got our stuff from the same soil. Right. As the storytellers around the world. And we, you know, we mold them and give them the cadence and rhythm and language and characters that, that are part of our side guys, but they're not ours. They don't belong to us. And we can't, you know, we can't create them into these possessions that only some of us can have and own. And I think, too, I mean, it's easy to sort of dismiss it as cliche, but there are only so many stories, right? Like, hero's journey, guy walks into a bar, woman leaves her <laughs> husband. Like, I mean, ultimately, it sort of does boil down to some really simple common thing. It's just the truth comes out in the details, right? Like the women in this particular, in Cemetery of Lost Stories, like the difference in the women and how they see the world and how they experience the world. I mean, (laughs) Alma's sisters. Can we talk about her sisters for a second? Have you actually ever written a novel where we don't have four sisters? I feel like all of the novels have four sisters. Hmm. Well, the historical novel. No, the well, the Mirabai sisters were were four sisters, but I didn't make that up. <laughs> no, I know you didn't make that up. It was amazing to discover but, that. Oh my gosh, there were four. There yeah, four of them, and the second one who survived to tell the story, and I'm the second one in my family. Oh my gosh! But um, no, I think that uh, saving the world uh, didn't have. Uh, oh right, I'm sorry. Sisters yeah, yeah. and uh, in the name of Salome, but more. Those were historical figures I had, you know, inherited the story. So, but I've always been interested in groups of women and 
whether it's Shahrazad in her harem saving all the women in her kingdom by being the storyteller who sort of tames the sultan with her stories mm -hmm. from, Sh from Shahrazad um, to yeah, I I I admitted my own um, my own biography that I come from a family of all women, all sisters, and without their without us moving into our United States of American lives together and being support systems and listening ears and interpreters and storytellers together, I don't think we could have made it. And groups of women have always interested me, the power of that. And they have classically been the transmitter of stories, you know, as they're, as they're quilting, as they're baking, as they come together, you know. Um, so I'm really interested in that in that world of of that that female power um, and community of women. Well, and I really enjoyed watching Alma get her sisters to sort of move in the direction <laughs> <laughs> that they needed to move. Her sisters, they are wonderful women in their own right. And then you also translate all of their names into English. And that's when I really laughed. And I'm just going to let readers come to that on their own, but it, dad had a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. And also I think in our, in our Dominican culture, especially we, we give these names that you don't even think about because they're so common and they're out there. Right. And then when you come to the United States and you have this bilingual look at them, you think, oh my God, you really named somebody, Bienvenida Inocencia, Welcome Innocence. You really named someone, you know, uh, Consuelo, consolation, that humor that's created through uh, a bilingual, bicultural lens can also be interesting. Yeah. I think it's really necessary too. I mean, a lot, a lot happens in Cemetery of Untold Stories. A lot happens across decades in this book. And I think though that when things are hard, we need to remember that we can also have humor like humor is not something that we have to lock away in a box and be done with because things are hard. Like if we can't make fun of the hard stuff, if we can't make fun of the stuff that just, I think we miss out on too much if we do that. Well, I think a sense of humor is a sense of perspective, you know, and I think to, to be able to put things, to shift the perspective is really valuable because the danger is then that you know the danger of a single story, the danger, the danger of a single self, you know that you only see things from your perspective, and there's a kind of diminishment to that. And I think again, why I also love stories because I mean, basically, when you read a book and you, you know, are engaged in it, you become the other. <laughs> How weird is that? You know, for the pay, for the for the time that you're inside that novel. You can be an enslaved girl in the South. You can be a Danish prince, mm -hmm. you know, in the 16th century. You can be, you can be all of these things. And I, I can't help but feel that that kind of enrichment that happens is also something that eventually, hopefully, can translate into the kinds of people we are in the world because it's the same muscles of the imagination that have to be stretched for compassion and activism that are at work when you're reading and becoming someone else. Well, I mean, famously, I think it was about 10 years ago, there was a study done that said reading fiction increases your compassion. And I love the idea that you can build a muscle, right? Like compassion to me is, it's a muscle. Yeah. And um, to know that you can build a muscle by turning pages and engaging with words and people that you might not otherwise encounter. I think that's really, it's really special. And I don't mean that in like a magical, transformative, necessarily way. Every reader brings themselves to a book. And I think if you can find yourself in a world where you might be rethinking some things that you thought before, I mean, yeah, sure, it's always nice to have an opinion reaffirmed. But if a book can, can put you in a place where you can be a little more open hearted, I think that's kind of a bigger challenge. Yeah. than just being like, hey, this is a great book and I'm going to read 600 pages of X, Y, or Z. That's great too, that it all has a place. Is what I, I agree. I, I hope some, sometimes someone will, will do a 
a deep study of people in history that did horrible things and good things, and which ones were readers? <laughs> <laughs> did they only read one text and then become fixated with it, which is dangerous? Or did, you know, were they wide reading? I mean, when I think of our recent history and who I would say that it was very obvious he was a reader was Barack Obama. I mean, he wrote and he spoke and he referenced things in history and literature that are, you know, showed a spectrum of um, curiosity. Because that's the other thing, that a wide reading reader has this quality that I always held sacred in the classroom, curiosity. I think that when you're curious, you're open to understanding and taking things in that might not be things you know. Because uh, where did I recently hear some someone say, uh, you can't learn things that you think you already know. So, you know, curiosity is holy and it's wonderful. And doesn't your curiosity, though, drive everything you write, whether it's the poetry or the books for younger yeah. readers? And certainly, I mean, the books that we all know and think of when we think of you. I just feel like you get an idea and you've, you've talked in the past about how disciplined you are in some ways about your writing practice and not necessarily in other ways. But curiosity really is your engine because you're always like, well, once I have the idea, then I can just sit down and kind of get there. But I don't plan methodically where I'm going. That's really accurate. I think I, you know, I'm disciplined in keeping the habit because I'm a moody writer, you know? And if if I let mood be the horse that holds the cart, I would never write, you know, because I'd be all over the place. So I I I need the of uh, the practice, like in a practice of meditation, a practice of yoga. I need the practice of writing. So that it's not something that I choose depending on my mood. So that's true. But I, I, you know, people say, where do you get your ideas? And I think, ideas? If an idea came knocking, I wouldn't open the door. It's more like a pebble in my shoe. Something <laughs> happens. I read about something. Someone tells me something. And I can't get it out of my shoe, my head. And it's only through the writing process that I can sort of get to some degree of of comfort in the end, where I can, the you know, the the pebble is shaken out and put on the pages of of a of a book I write. So I think that's where my stories come from. That element of curiosity and you know, it's it's sort of also like the grain of sand that supposedly the clam makes into a pearl. That it's it's something that it, it's. Annoying might might not be the accurate word, but something that's that throws you off, that's slightly irritating, or that you can't a preoccupation. And can't, you've got to look at it, and uh, believe me, it drives it drives the people in my life crazy because <laughs> I can e easily um, lead them here and there after some curiosity that I've that I've taken on. Is it also that curiosity that leads you to your characters? I feel like once you get the voice of your characters, that's really when you're mm -hmm. most comfortable, it sounds like. And certainly reading you, I mean, all of these voices, and not to dismiss the men, there's some great men in this book too, but yeah. I really like these women a lot. I really, really like these women, <laughs> but I feel like maybe Alma showed up first, but Philomena was close behind. Right, right. And you're right that for me, I don't know that it's going to be a character until I've gotten that voice. I've gotten that rhythm. And it's not just the content of what that person is and what they're going to say, but something about the rhythm and perspective. And I think it's, you know, so it's the way I feel too mm -hmm. about people. I think I'm, I'm have to be a bit of a reclusive because I, I just say I'm too curious if you let me out in public. And I, you know, I just get in so intrigued by people's stories. And it doesn't have to be, you know, important people or or, you know, classic stories, but just the stories that that are behind people is just astonishing. But yes, um curiosity and uh and the voice 
And uh, Filomena definitely was, became very important to me. Yeah. She's a great character. She's really great. 84, our first collection of poetry. Do you think you're going back to poetry at any point? I've, I've been working on, a, on putting together a book of poems because all along I've been writing poetry. Poetry is my first love. And I think I went to poetry originally because when we came into English and I was a 10-year-old, I missed the cadence and musicality. And poetry was a way, especially rhymed poetry, words, was a way that I heard Spanish and English. But I've always loved um, poetry. So, And I write with my ear as much as, you know, with my eyes that I, mm-hmm. I have to hear that voice. So poetry is something that I keep returning to. And it's, if the soul speaks, it speaks in poetry. I, it's my first love, definitely. It's also so voice driven that it makes perfect sense to me that you go back and forth between poetry and prose because prose, you know, we know it when we see it, like we know the voice, you know, when you're caught up in the world. And maybe it's this overarching close third, or maybe it's Philomena, you know, saying something to Alma or Alma talking to her sisters. I mean, voice is comprised of so many different things, but, you know, poetry without voice. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And also something about poetry. I often start my writing day by reading a few pages of poetry because I find that it tunes me, uh, you know, like the Choir master's um, little whistle that he blows. Everybody, you know, it just gives me a sense of what language can do, what kinds of uh, flights it can take, and somehow it 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 sets up the bar for me. So, as Pascal famously said, you know, had I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. There's something about its concision and its precision. That even when you have characters and you have a lot more leeway and a lot more words and a lot more pages, there's something about pacing and that kind of precision, which I appreciate in fiction writers, even if it's not poetry. And I also appreciate in fiction writers and now that audiobooks are such a big thing. You can hear, you know, a Sadie Smith. It's I knew it from the page, but when you hear the audio of her books, you go, yes. That's what was in my head, you know, and um, and so I really, I really respect and enjoy writers that have that music and their voices, um, uh, you know, and the range that a Sidney Smith had. So when you're reading just for pleasure or just not necessarily work, you're reading for language first. Then it sounds like because language and voice to me are so entangled that you can't. Right really separate them. I mean, I read for language first. I, I, characters are great. If stuff happens, that's great. But I, yeah, I need, I need the language to really crack. Otherwise it's just content, you know, it, it doesn't have the charge, uh, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, that charge that really gives you a kind of, um, it, it just, it, it's sort of like, the waves in your body are going in inside those characters. You know, it's it's an immersion. So it's very important to me. But I think it's so hard for me to disentangle. It's all of a piece, you know, the narrative, the character, the voice, the surprises. I love surprises in writing where, you know, it could be the surprise of a word used in an unusual way or, or a surprise of plot. So I read... I, you know, when people say, uh, what do you read for pleasure? I think I always read for pleasure because, okay, there's research writing and you're, you know, plotting through some text, but there's always pleasure in, in the discoveries you make of, of certain facts, especially if you're reading for research and you discover something and you go, oh my God, you know, the character starts to balloon inside you because of that little tiny, you know, genie in a bottle. Um, so I love that, but um, I do think that reading and story is just like, you know, I, I always have a book in my handbag, and I know I can now do it on a screen, but I just, 
just love the physicality of a book too. And uh, I'll go, you know, we're going, we make a grocery run and I take a, a book along and Bill says, why are you taking that? Yeah. I said, well, I never know. I'm like, we might be stranded at Shaw's, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I'll need my book. You know, <laughs> as a person who does a similar thing, yes, I it's yes. just it's always better to have something just in case. And also, books don't take up that much space necessarily; exactly. they're very portable. <laughs> yeah, I never understand when I get on a plane and you know we're going four hours to the DR, and nobody's reading. Yeah, and, you know, I used to do this scouting. I I go to the far back uh, little bathroom just to walk through it and just. Be curious to look at what people were reading. Now people are looking at their little phones, so maybe they're reading on it. But just some people just sit there and they would just sit there and just sit there. And I thought, oh my gosh, how do they yeah. do that? You know, <laughs> and all the more power to them. They're probably meditating and a lot more enlightened than I am. <laughs> but I still think that's tough. I miss the days, though, of being able to walk up and down a plane and see what people are reading. I mean, yeah. that was always uh, because there was always something really surprising. Similarly, on the subway, you don't necessarily oh, that, yeah. get to sort of eavesdrop on people's reading kind of thing just by looking at jackets. And and I'm always trying to figure out sort of what an edition of something is like, is that a paper? OK, you found well, that you're used. A to I, I, I'm nosy. I'm nosy. <laughs> you're curious. Give it yes. A OK, thing, girl. Yes. The polite way of saying it is I'm curious, but yes, I do. And I really always just want to say, I'm like, okay, I understand. Uh, yep. Okay. I just, yeah. I, I know think, who uh, you are. Tell me what you're reading and I know who you are. I have a pretty good idea sometimes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, when you see someone reading a book that you've really loved, it's like that person is your, you found a kindred spirit. Even if you don't say two words to them, you feel like you're walking in a friendlier world. Someone else loves Susanna Clark's Piranesi, my yep. current great love, or Claudia Pinero's Elena Knows. Uh, these books that I think, oh, boy, this is great. Yeah. There's two yeah. of us. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask what you're working on besides the poetry, or is it just you're really focused on the poetry and that's the next thing, or are you working on multiple things, maybe? Well, I'm, the next thing in line is to get the, the poems out, but I do have a manuscript that I'm working on, a novel, and it involves, it does involve literacy, but within this United States culture more than uh, out there. And also, it involves shame and things we hide because we're ashamed. And as you grow older, how do you make peace? with cells that you would like to just leave, like Amma's failed novels, failed selves, you would just like to leave in the past, you know? We all have them if we live long enough where we we almost think, how in the hell could I, could I, and there, thereby hangs a tail. And it's one that I can't wait to read because honestly, aging sort of still feels like a final frontier of sorts. Uh, it's certainly in literature. I mean, I have fond memories of things I did when I was younger. And then I have some memories where I'm like, ah, that was a learning experience. But I don't necessarily feel like we've really made space for stories of getting older and that aren't, you know, my housekeeper stole all of my things and ran away. I'm not talking about those stories. We seem to have those yeah, stories yeah, down, yeah, yeah. but just sort of that internal landscape of what it means to age and how we want to shed not necessarily the past, but past selves. That's yeah. not past selves in the past are not the same thing. I'm really, yeah, I'm really curious to see where we all go. When I wrote Garcia Girls, part of it was um, I, I often was writing to gaps in the shelf, you know, silences, uh, things that I didn't see in literature and I needed. It's not that I was on some sort of righteous um, you know, move to fill the shelves. It was more that I go to books to understand and make meaning. And when I don't see where I'm at in the books, I, I'm lost as a person. And more and more, 
I've noticed, you know, we all are becoming aware of ageism in all kinds of fields, but also in literature where age, um, where people who are older age are, you know, um, delegate, relegated to the background or they're the abuelita or they're, they're kind of cliches. And actually, there's this term that I recently discovered by this um, Canadian critic, Constance Rock, and she writes about the Volendums Roman, I can barely pronounce it, which is a term she coined for the bookend of the Bildens Roman, the novel of, you know, growing up and coming of age. And these are novels that she's identifying as novels about growing old, as more and more of our baby boomers, of which I'm a member, are, are aging. I'm curious, and we're growing increasingly curious, what does it mean to age? And as I heard someone describe it, you know, we all are going to age if we're lucky enough and live long enough, but only a few of us will become elders. So what does that mean? And that landscape to understand and take it away from the cliche, demystify it. And so I'm really curious about this landscape of of growing old and and in Alma's case, growing old in a craft she spent a lifetime practicing. What what does that mean? You know, you know, how do you give closure to that? How do you understand it? Well, I also think we need to broaden our definition of coming of age too. Coming of age isn't just something that happens when you're 13 or 18 or 25. Right. It can happen when you're 80. You can have a realization. I think we've seen it in some cases, maybe at our own dinner tables, but, you know, we have a chance to grow and change. And it's just, are we open to it? Are we open to doing things differently? And that's a bigger question. That's a good insight that there's coming of age at every age. You, you know, so often I think you have to reinvent yourself. Constantly. I used to think that by the time, see, this was my own cliche about aging. By the time I was my age, I'm going to be 74 in a couple of weeks. By the time I was my age, I was going to have it all figured out. I was going to be this set self. And hopefully she was going to be uh, a nice person. Mm -hmm. Nope. Every, every, every stage of life you, and, and it's a good thing because it doesn't work anymore. It falls apart, but you have the opportunity to put it together in a larger version of yourself that includes that, but enlarges you beyond that, you know, particular self. I mean, I don't want my life to be static. I don't want my books to be static. I just, I, I just, I would like to be able to continue to sort of pull from lots of different places and... This has been an absolute delight. Julia Alvarez, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Mila. This was so much fun. Thank you for your flexibility and, uh, and, your, and your warmth and cariño. You know, I'm just starting out on this, talking about this. So, you know, you, you're apprehensive. You don't even know what, what to say about it. And you made it easy. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.